enough to come out in this terrible rain that we're having. But we're here to be a family, aren't we? The family of God. So it's good to see you all today. Before we begin, I want to say thank you to Shirai and Patience for leading the worship last week. I've heard great things about it and I've found two ducks. So I hope you've all remembered the message of the ducks last week, which I believe was not to just quack quack on a Sunday, but to make sure that you do what you say you're going to do. So thank you very much, Patience and Shirai, for your ministry to the core last week. Now, I said a few months ago that, unfortunately, um, we only value what we can count. So I've been fighting this battle in myself that there are more valuable things than the things you can count, but I've given in to it. Sorry, are you still with me? I'm talking too much. Because human nature values what it can count. So I've decided, instead of trying not to count things, you've got to make sure that you count the right things, haven't you? So we've got a scripture reading to start us off, and we've got some PowerPoint slides to help us. Hopefully. The first thing we're going to count this morning is we're going to count the stars. And I believe that somebody has a scripture reading from Genesis chapter 15 that's going to help us with this. Oh, it's Pam. I've forgotten who it was, but it's Pam. Thank you. And so from Genesis 15 verses 1 and 5, it says... Some time later, the Lord spoke to Abraham in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abraham, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. But Abraham replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Then the Lord took Abraham outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. Amen. So the first thing we have to do in worship is we have to look up, don't we? We have to look up and not count our problems, but count our blessings. Now, I've got some facts for you about stars. There should be another screen with this. If we try to count the stars, there are apparently... 700 billion trillion stars in the universe. Okay, now I don't know what billion million means. So it means 700, I sound like Beyonce, don't I? That's how many stars there are in the universe. That's the promise that God gave to Abraham, that actually you will be so blessed that you won't be able to count it. But we're going to try this morning. We're going to stand up and we're going to sing our opening song, Count Your Blessings, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. So let's stand up and sing together.
Am I still on? Please have a seat. Okay, so Abraham is the father of our faith. And God took him outside and said, look up at the stars. But even great Abraham had his doubts on his journey of faith. So God had to say it to him again. He had to say, look up and count the stars and look down and count the sand. We have to keep our feet on the ground, don't we, sometimes? Sometimes, if you can't look up and count the stars, look down and count the sand. And we've got another reading to help us with this. Is it Massimo? Good. Massimo's going to bring the reading to us. I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore and through your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed so that's a great blessing isn't it not just a blessing for abraham but a blessing for the whole earth so we've got some facts about sand and about stars and hopefully they will come up now okay so we've got to go through the first two that's the facts about stars Look up and look down and count the stars and the sand. Would you like to know how many grains of sand there are on earth? You're dying to know, aren't you? You're dying to know. Okay, can we have the facts about sand? There are approximately, I can't say this, <laughs> this I think it's se sextillion, 775 sextillion grains of sand, which is 750-000-000-000-000-000, which is roughly 10,000 stars for every grain of sand on earth. Now, I find that mind-blowing, don't you? That there are 10,000 stars for every grain of sand on earth. And when we look up and see how big, because God is bigger than that, how much more is the Lord and all that he has for us than what we are dealing with on earth? Now we're going to count something else because Jesus went on to count some things. Look at the sparrows and look in the mirror. And this is what Jesus said about counting. Has somebody got Luke's gospel for us? No, but he's always, it's Eileen. The one about the sparrows. What is the price of two of five sparrows? Two copper coins, yet God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs on your head are numbered. So don't be afraid, for you are more valued to God than a whole flock. Of sparrows. Mm. Would you like to know how many sparrows there are? You're getting bored with this, aren't you? I'm trying to give you things to count this morning. How many sparrows have we got on earth? We've got one, six, one and a half billion sparrows 
and not one of them falls to the ground without your father knowing. And even you, on the average head, there is a hundred thousand hairs on your head and they're all numbered. Yeah, on the average head, not on every head, on the average head, okay? But that tells us that God knows the details of each life, of even the sparrows' lives. So I hope you've been encouraged by a bit of counting today, and I hope you feel blessed We're going to sing again and uh, we're going to use a video for this song. We sung this song a couple of weeks ago. It should be the words on the sheet. I will stand on every promise of your word. And if you feel able and you want to stand, please stand with us now and we'll enjoy this song together. So while we're waiting for the text to come on, I just want to say, when we finish singing it, hopefully, I just want you to be ready with something that has inspired you this week. You may not feel inspired because it's raining heavily, but has there been something this week that has inspired you? Have we got the video ready yet? Not quite. Okay, while we're waiting, does someone want to read out the first verse for me? Help me out. Wonderful. We still don't have the video. Oh, something's happening. Technology never works when it's raining in this place, does it? Oh. Do we need to make a different plan? Just give him a sec. Okay. Uh, That will be written on my gravestone. Just give me a minute. (laughs) Okay.
On the subject of God's promises, um, this week I was reading Romans 4, and um, there's a promise for Abraham, and you were talking about Abraham today, and they were old, and God said to them, you will have a son. And it says, as he waited, and he was getting older, his faith was getting stronger. And I just thought, I don't know about that, but I could do with some of that. (laughs) So I was thinking... God give me faith like Abraham so that it grows stronger when the natural world is saying no. So that's the inspiration I got this week. I've been inspired this week. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God found, formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed the breath on life into the man's nose, and the man becomes a living person. Yeah. I love that text oh, where God breathes into the man he's made, and he comes alive with the breath of God. Um, I'm going to tell you a story, and I don't want you all to hate me, but when we first moved to Catford, we'd moved from the countryside, and it was countryside by the sea, and we used to come in on the train and land at Catford Bridge and walk through where the fish stall is, and I don't really like fish. And the man running the fish stall would empty the fish water all over the pavement. So when we arrived in Catford and we used to come from the garage, there'd be this smell of fish. And I used to walk through it and I used to pray, oh God, make Catford clean. Okay. (laughs) Every time I got off the train, God, make Catford clean. And then I thought, no, this isn't good enough for Catford. So then I started to pray, God, make Catford beautiful. Okay, 
And then, one day, I walked out and the sun was shining over the theatre and I looked up and God said to me, Catford is already beautiful. And I tell you what inspires me because yesterday I went back to the pop-up shop in Catford and the women that run the Catford shop believe so much in lifting this borough up and I'm inspired by them. I'm inspired to look around Lewisham borough, to look around Catford and see how beautiful it already is. So don't let the smell of fish put you off, okay? Because the beauty is there. Anybody else feeling inspired this week? I won't stare at you. I will look at the ceiling. And if anyone stands up, that will be absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. People make it beautiful. Okay, so we've got one last thing to count this morning before we move on. And I want you to close your eyes just for a moment and count your breath. So close your eyes for one minute and count your breaths. Okay, so how many breaths did we have? How many breaths did you have, David? A hundred? <laughs> Breathing very rapidly. Anyone else have breaths that they counted? 29 breaths. <laughs> it's the excitement of being in worship this morning. Anyone else count their breath? Did you count the ones going out as the ones going in? 26. Okay. Because part of worship, we look up, don't we, at the Lord. We look down at the earth that we live in. But we need to look within as well. We need to take moments of stillness to look within. So I've got some facts about breathing today that I'm going to share with you. Can we have the facts about breathing Okay, the average adult takes 12 to 16 breaths per minute. So I think you were counting the ones going out as the uh, ones, uh, ones coming in. No, when, when you say count your breaths, you start breathing more because you're becoming <laughs> Okay, apparently the average adult takes 12 to 16 breaths. Newborn babies breathe 35 times in a minute. By the age of one, you breathe 30 times. By the age of four, 20 times. By the age of 15, 13 times a minute. We take 960 breaths an hour, 23,040 a day, 8,409,000 a year, and a really big number, 672 in a lifetime. So that's facts about respiration. And here are some facts about inspiration. Inspiration means to breathe or to blow into. It comes from the Latin word spira, which means to breathe and is linked with words respiration and 
spirit. So it's a comfort read to us that God formed the man and breathed into him and he became a living being. And we're going to have a time of prayer. Now Pam is going to play the tune, Breathe On Me, Breath of God, which is 294 in the songbook. And we're not going to sing it. We're going to listen as she plays it through. And then I want some volunteers to read out the words as their prayer this morning. So we'll listen to Pam playing it and then can I have four volunteers to read out these words. Somebody read out the words of verse 1 as our prayer this morning. Okay. And somebody with verse 2. So let's breathe together. Lord, I pray for us as a family of living, breathing people that you will come and breathe your inspiration into us now. And if we're feeling despairing, if we're feeling hopeless, if we're feeling uninspired, that your spirit will come once again and breathe that inspirational, life-changing, wonderful power of God into us as a body of your people today. Amen. Amen. Now Michael's going to come and he's going to bring an inspirational Bible reading to us from the book of Acts. So we have uh, two Bible readings this morning to share with you. So we're going to start with the first one. And it comes from Acts 20. And we're going to be reading verses 16 through to 26. Acts 20 verses 16 through to 26. Paul had decided to sail past... Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you, From the first day I came into the province of Asia, 
I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. We'll finish there. Amen. So we're going to continue in our worship just now and we're going to give to the Lord in the offering and we're going to sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain, over the hills and far away, that Jesus Christ is Lord. So if you have something to offer to the Lord and you want to bring it just now and place it on the altar, we'll do that as we sing this song together. Let's pray. <laughs> Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for bringing us together once again. I pray for the offering. As Jesus feed thousands of people with few bread and few fishes, I pray for the multiplication of the, of the offering as we use it in your kingdom. We thank you for your provision in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for being brave, everybody, this morning. You've had to be brave. Now Michael's going to come and bring the second part of the Bible reading, and he's going to bring God's word to us today. So we're picking up the Bible reading in the next chapter. We're covering two chapters this, this week. So Acts 21, and we're going to be reading verse 1 through to 17. After we'd torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Cush. The next day, we went to Rhodes, and from there to Patraea. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia. 
and went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed to Syria. We landed at Tyra, where our ship was to un upload its cargo. We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. When it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including the wives and children, accompanied us out of the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship and they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyra and landed at uh, Potalesias, or uh, Ptolemy. Lovely. Thank you, Rebecca. Where we were greeted by brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied after he had been there a number of days. A prophet named Agabus came down from Judah. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it and said, The Holy Spirit says... In this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and hand him over to the Gentiles. When, they heard, when we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking your hearts? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. After this, we started on our way up to Jerusalem. So the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of Manasson, where we were to stay. He was a man from Cyprus and one of the early disciples. May God add his blessing to that word. Let's just have a word of prayer before we look at God's word. Father God, we just come before you and we give you thanks for your goodness and your love. We have been reminded about how generous you are and how plentiful the blessings are. And we pray that as we come to look at your word, we will be fed in our spirits. And we will be challenged in our souls. So that we will be better disciples of yours. I pray, dear Lord, that you will help me to be faithful to your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I came across a story about a man who was visiting a, a cathedral one day. And um, do, you, do you ever go on holiday and just have a look around the local cathedral? Yeah? It was, it was one of those kind of days. He, he was just going around. And he was having a look around. And when he was in the cathedral, in a back little corner he'd never noticed before, he found a telephone. And there was a sign above the telephone, and the sign said direct line to heaven, 100 pounds per minute. He was astounded. He'd, he'd never seen anything like this in the cathedral before. So he found one, one of the curates that was about and, and asked him about it. He said, this telephone, what is it about? Is it real? Is this a, a spoof or something? He said, no, no. He said, every cathedral in the United Kingdom has a telephone which is a direct line to heaven. So this man was intrigued by this. He thought it was incredible. So he decided that in his spare time and his days off, he would travel around the UK and find all these telephones. So he went to Liverpool. Uh, he, he came to London. He went to Wales. He went to Ireland. He went to Scotland. He went all over the place. 
until one day he found himself in Leeds. And um, he was in the cathedral there, and he was looking around, and as always, he found a little telephone tucked away in a little corner with a sign that said, direct line to heaven. But this time, it said, calls 10p per minute. He couldn't believe it. Everywhere else he'd been, in Liverpool, in London, in uh, Ireland, in Scotland, in Wales, everywhere it was a hundred pound a minute. But in Leeds, it was 10p per minute. He, he didn't understand why. So he went and he, he found one of the curates and he said, I've gone all over the country and, and in every cathedral I found this telephone. But this one says 10p per minute, when all the other ones say £100 per minute. Why is that? And the guy smiled slyly and said, well, it's simple. You're in Yorkshire. This is God's country. It's a local call. (laughs) Communicating with God. Wouldn't it be nice if it was so easy as if we just had a telephone to pick up and we would hear another voice on the other side. Of course, we don't have to pay to talk to God, which is the good thing, isn't it? We can pray. But sometimes hearing God's voice can get a little bit confusing, can't it? Knowing what it is that God is actually telling us to do can be confusing. And from the readings that we have here, we seem to have a bit of confusion going on. We seem to have a bit of confusion going on around what it is that Paul should be doing in relation to going to Jerusalem. He's traveling to Jerusalem, okay? He's, he's set his mind on this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to let anything else um, detour me. And yet, almost everywhere he stops, somebody says to him, don't go. Please stay. Don't go there. And in a lot of ways, the reactions we see are reactions that we can see in ourselves when God is speaking to us. I wonder, have you ever heard of something called tunnel vision? Yeah? Can can somebody remind me, what's tunnel vision? Just to make sure you're all awake and that you're still alive. What's tunnel vision? Yes. It's, it's literally as if you just kind of take one long tube and all you're willing to see is what you can see down that tube. You block everything else out, every other possibility out. I wonder, have you ever done this when you've prayed? You pray about something and there can only be one possible answer. And it just so happens that that one possible answer is the answer you want to hear. God couldn't possibly say anything else. Paul stops at his first stop. And we we read in Acts 21 verse 4, we read, Having set sail, Paul and his companions arrived at Tyra. Having got passage on a merchant ship, they were given a chance to stay in the area for a week as the ship did its business. Here he finds the good news has already gone ahead of him and he finds believers already living there. And we're told, through the Spirit, they urged him not to go to Jerusalem. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? Through the Spirit, they urged him not to go to Jerusalem. So it doesn't actually say, the Spirit said, don't go to Jerusalem. What it seems to imply is that whoever received that message interpreted the message to mean don't go to Jerusalem. And when we, we 
allow ourselves to become blinded, we seem to have an ability to change anything that might happen around to mean that we should do the thing we want to do. Don't we? In a sense, we deny what God is actually trying to say. We become so focused on what we want to hear, we deny the truth when it's in front of us, even if it is God's Spirit that is giving us a message. We find a way to turn it around to what we want. These people didn't want to see Paul get hurt. They might have just met Paul, but they've heard of Paul. They know the good that Paul's been doing, and they want that to continue. And let's be honest, that's not a bad thing, is it? We, of course, we would want the, the message of God to continue to go on, but God had a special purpose. And part of that purpose is that it means that Paul is going to have to go through suffering. He's going to have to go through hardship. So they see that message that he's going to have a hard time, and they decide the interpretation is the exact opposite of what the Spirit is saying to Paul, which is, go to Jerusalem. We've got to make sure we don't allow ourselves to cut off. When we pray, we, we might not like it, but no is an actual answer that God can give us. Prayer is not some magic means by which we manipulate the world to get what we want. Prayer is by the means that we commune with God and we come to an understanding of what His will is. So he goes on his journey. He goes off. He decides... You know, fair enough, that's how you see things, but I know what it is I've got to do. So he keeps going. And um, in the end, he lands up um, in Caesarea. And he stays in the house of Philip the Evangelist. Does anybody remember Philip the Evangelist? We've heard of him. I know we've been in Acts for ages now, so you might have forgotten. But we've heard of Philip the Evangelist. Do you know which one he is? We, we've heard of him in Acts. He, he was one of the deacons, so he's mentioned. It says he's one of the seven. So when they were having the dispute over um, that the apostles shouldn't be waiting on tables and they appoint people to help sort that out, he does that. And then we run into him a little, little bit later on after he's done helping serve the tables with the widows. The eunuch, that's right. He's the guy who baptized the eunuch and then was whisked away by the Spirit. Yes. And finally, he settled, seems to have settled in Caesarea. And he's got four daughters. All the daughters are prophetesses. They all have the gift of prophecy. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because Paul comes, he stays with them in the house. Not a single one of them does it say... That one of them prophesied that Paul shouldn't go to Jerusalem or prophesy that anything is is going to happen to him. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, they didn't hear anything. It just means it's not recorded in Scripture. Maybe they did hear, and actually they learned from their dad a long ago, that it's more important to be faithful to the Holy Spirit than it is to try and guard your own life and save your own skin. So somebody else comes, this, this chap, Agabus, he comes along, and um, Agabus, it says, coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. So here it's, we see a progression. 
They're not denying the truth of what Paul um, believes, that he should be going to Jerusalem, but they're encouraging him to avoid it. Have you ever tried to avoid something unpleasant? Yeah? We do that, don't we? We, we probably do that in our work. Some parts of our job we love, some, job, some parts we don't love. So we always seem to be able to find ourselves doing the busy stuff we enjoy doing and putting off the stuff we don't want to until we have to do it. We, we have an, a natural aversion as human beings to try and avoid difficult situations or things we don't like, and especially getting hurt. Now, if I was to, to go through here and say the Holy Spirit took me and I came up to Shirai and I said, Shirai, God is going to use you in a powerful way, but you are going to die in a horrible death. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That would be our reaction. Somehow we have it in our mind. We have this belief, which is not true, that God won't let anything bad ever happen to us. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read the Gospels, Jesus seems to say again and again, you will be persecuted for me. He told his disciples, you will go through hardship." You will experience torture and death and persecution and rejection. So how have we gotten this message that somehow being a Christian gives us a superpower from anything bad happening? This, this misbelief can lead us to try and avoid doing what God is calling us to do. Now, in some way, that's natural. We don't want to suffer. Nobody wants to suffer. I came across a, a great quote. Um, let's see if I can find it. Just the way, isn't it? I can't find it now. Where is it gone? Apologies. I'm normally more organized than this. Apparently, I haven't put it in my notes. But I came, I came across this great quote, and it's by a chap named Oswald Chambers. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, Oswald Chambers. He, he said, he basically says that... Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody in their right mind wants to suffer. But for saints, if it comes down to suffering for being obedient to God, obedience to God always comes first. He worded it much more beautifully than I did because he's a fantastic uh, Christian writer. He's dead now, so I suppose he's not writing anything new. But... Uh, the point is the same. Yeah, okay, it is insane to seek being hurt. But as a Christian, we have to learn to come to that place where obedience is more important than anything else. What did we read in Acts 20? Paul says that I must go to Jerusalem. I don't know what I'm going to be faced with, but all I know is everywhere I've been, the Holy Spirit keeps saying that imprisonment and beating and torture await me. But then he goes on to say, but my life is nothing unless I complete the work that God has given for me. When we avoid or deny, we're not living up to our full life's potential. We might be doing that because either we're so determined that the answer must be some fantastic thing that we want, 
or because we don't want to go through pain or hardship. But as long as we keep putting that off, as long as we keep putting off faithfulness and obedience, we don't experience the full blessing of being a servant of God. I think if there was some way that I I could call Paul up and ask him, do you feel you lived a blessed life or a cursed life? I'm confident he'd say a blessed life. Because nothing compares to being in relationship with God. And actually, in being in relationship with God, we learn to abide in His will. And in abiding in His will, we find a certain amount of peace, a certain amount of strength that we never knew that we had before. Because it's a strength that comes outside of ourselves. I wonder today if God is saying something to you in your prayer life, in your devotional life? Has He been calling you into something new, something difficult, something which requires sacrifice? Maybe might even require a bit of ridicule from others or people to think you've gone crazy. Are you trying to deny it? Have you determined the answer is opposite to what you're hearing and trying to look for every reason why what you think is what God is actually saying? Are you trying to avoid it because you know the truth? I can remember I uh, came to the UK just before my 22nd birthday and my brother lived in the Peterborough area and him and his wife at the time, they had this little flat above some shops And I was living with them. And I can remember being in their living room. And um, the officer uh, at the core had asked to come and see me. Um, He he wanted... I wasn't in trouble, by the way. I hadn't been naughty. I hadn't done anything wrong. But I was new, and he wanted to come and see me. And he wanted to talk to me. And and I knew it was something serious um, that he wanted to talk to me about. But I also knew that I didn't want to talk about what he wanted to talk about because I had an inkling about what he was going to talk about. And I can remember kneeling in the living room and I knew God was saying, talk about Salvation Army officership. But my prayer was anything but that. Anything but that, Lord. Because I wanted to be a youth leader. I wanted to go off and do youth ministry somewhere. But do you know what? I don't regret ever having said yes. And Rebecca, we've had some hard times. I don't need to go into that. But I, I have been a broken person at times because of following that calling. But I would never go back on not having done it. So I say to you today, whatever you feel God leading to you. Don't pull back from it. Like Paul, focus in on it. Yeah, you may get a couple of words and they may be from the Lord letting you know because what God was doing was not trying to put Paul off. He was preparing Paul for what was to come. He wasn't trying to put him off. But being faithful to the Lord is so much greater than trying to do it on your own. I'm going to hand back to Rebecca. Just to reflect on what Michael has said, um, I know myself that I never want to do things that are uncomfortable. But the promise is that God will be with us. And that's what we cling on to. Because life is difficult. But God promises never to leave us alone. So we're going to sing this song. I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. 
And we're just going to take a few moments just to reflect on it, to ask the Lord if he has something specific for us this week, a specific word. And we're just going to take these moments as we sing to listen to what he has to say to us. Let's sing together. Lord, we remember that your presence is not limited to these four walls, that you are the God of the universe. And I pray that as we leave this place at the end of our worship time, we will have throughout these weeks those moments of inspiration where we kneel perhaps in the living room or kneel down in a quiet moment in a place of work, setting aside everything just to listen to your voice for a moment and to be obedient to your will. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will fill us with your courage and with your faith to step out and to be your people, to be breathing in the power of the Spirit in our every day and following your plan and your word for our lives. And we ask this in the powerful, in the mighty name of Jesus who made all the stars and the grains of sand whose eye is on the sparrow and who counts the hairs on our head. We put our faith and our trust in you, whatever the future may bring. Amen. Amen. 
Now Shirai's going to come and he's going to share the announcements with us and then we're going to sing our final song together. Thank you. Um, Good to see you all. Good to see you, Matthew, with us this morning. Um, So firstly, I just want to remind you to remember some core folk who are in need of prayer. So Doreen Cooper was not with us this morning. Uh, Monica, uh, Monica Serma, is she out of hospital yet? She's still in hospital. Okay. And Douglas Gardner, please continue to remember. And also Pauline, I know it was your birthday, so we'll come to that, but you're having an operation this week, so we shall remember you in our prayers. A couple of key dates to remind you. So next week is Remembrance Sunday, Sunday the 13th, will be Remembrance Sunday. Um, The Christmas collection will be starting from the 22nd of November, um, and Wednesday the 23rd, the signing sheet is at the back if you're able to help with that. And also the heat bank has started, so we're also looking for volunteers and the signing in sheet is also at the back. So it was Pauline's birthday. 90, what a wonderful change. <laughs> birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Pauline. Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Amen. And may the Lord continue to keep you. Have I forgotten anything? No. Good. No. Excellent. <laughs> Do you join us for tea and coffee after the meeting? Do you have a cake? I think we have some cakes and comfort has baked as well, which is really good. Now we started the heat bank this week on Wednesday, and when we arrived, the power had gone out. <laughs> So we had no heat to offer anybody. But praise the Lord, it came on before we opened the door, which is great. And we were able to offer some warmth. So God is good and he helps us when we step out in faith, even in the small things. So we're going to sing this great song of worship. My hope is built on nothing less. The Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let's stand together and make our song of praise this morning. (laughs) 